Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, e-seminar uh, with Dr. Nile Winters and uh, Dr. Judith McCall. And this uh, e-seminar is the first in a new series of seminars we'll be holding over the next few weeks. And their topic is going to be M Health in LMICs. So um, I can see from my screen um, people joining the seminar. So I think um, as the start time was four o'clock, we'll see a few more people joining um, as we go. And what I'm going to do is just keep everyone uh, muted. And if you've got a question, you should see a little hand icon. So just tap on the hand icon and that will mean that you're raising your hand. And then I can hand over the microphone to you uh, to speak. Or what might be easier, because there's quite a few people who are attending, is just to uh, post your message in the chat uh, box, which should be down on the bottom right uh, of your screen. Um, and also, if you just use the chat um, to say if you're having any problems, so things that might happen might be that you can't hear us speaking because we've accidentally muted ourselves, or if the slides aren't moving on or something like that, just if you could just post that in the chat, uh, then I can hear you. And you can also just type in the chat to say hello um, if you can hear me and uh, if you've got any uh, points you want to make. So let me just introduce uh, our speakers. Let me just check that we're recording and everything's going OK. OK, let me introduce our speakers. So first of all, um, talking for the first part of the seminar is going to be Dr. Nile Winters. And, uh, Dr. Winters is an associate professor at the University of Oxford uh, in uh, learning and new technologies in the Department of Education. And he's also a fellow of uh, Kellogg College. And if you want to follow Niall on Twitter, um, you can see his uh, NWIN is his Twitter uh, handle below. And I'll hand over to Niall in a minute to give you a bit more of an introduction to his talk. And then after Niall's finished talking for about 15 minutes, and we've had a few questions, uh, I'll hand over to Jude McCool. And Dr. Judith McCool is an associate professor at the University of Auckland, and she leads postgraduate courses in global health delivered within the Masters of Public Health and the Masters of Health Leadership programs at the University of Auckland. And her Twitter handle is Jude McCool there. So you can follow her on Twitter. Um, so without further ado, uh, I just wanted to just quickly mention that many of you will have seen the advert for this through the Health Informatics Forum website. So hopefully if uh, everything goes to plan, we'll be recording and the videos will be uh, uploaded to YouTube and I'll post a message on the forum to let everyone know they're available. Um, but you can use the forum for, if you've not signed up already, We've got lots of free online courses. Um, you can network with other members and we uh, try to post uh, news about uh, initiatives in digital health. Um, so now I'll just hand over to Niall and um, uh, he can start his talk. So let me just change presenter. And I'll just need to unmute him as well. Let me just unmute now. Okay, so you should be able to unmute now. Yeah, that works. Thanks, Chris, Chris. and thanks for organising and for the invite uh, to present. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk today about using technology to support um, the training and supervision of health workers in LMICs. Um, I'll talk about mainly focus on two areas, community health workers and training nurses, and um, both um, collaborative uh, projects um, that Chris and Shelby as well, who's here, have been involved in. So um, let's get started. So by way of background, I'm sorry, I'm just, there we go. Um, at the intersection of the Venn diagram there, so what I'm interested in is the intersection between um, technology training and uh, global health. So essentially looking at the development of um, new technologies, be they mobile, virtual reality technologies, and most likely using artificial intelligence 
to support the training of health workers. Um, from a theoretical perspective, we use a social justice and development framing for this, but um, I won't be talking about that today. So just focusing really on the intersection. Um, and a lot of our work focuses on working with the most marginalized in um, LMICs. One thing to keep in mind um, when working with the most marginalized is that digital technology, particularly in health, is often um, presented as a way to um, support their healthcare needs. Um, but there's lots of work, particularly in, in education, in communication, um, in internet studies, that shows that if you're not careful about how you de design and develop these technologies, they can actually lead to increased marginalization, particularly for people who are already disadvantaged. So what happens is instead of reducing a disadvantage, you actually end up um, adding to it so people become multiply disadvantaged. So I've just been in a number of references there if people want to, to read them on that background. So what we're trying to do is ensure that any um, intervention we develop, any technology we develop, does not uh, increase um, inequality in any way. Okay, so that's the first thing to keep in mind. Okay, and just by way of background, so where do we work? Well, we work mainly in East Africa, primarily in Kenya, and you'll see some photos there of the, the work we've been doing. On the left in um, rural areas in Kenya, and in the middle there in um, informal settlements, mainly um, Kibera. The photo on the right, I'll come back to in a second because it's from the project I'm going to talk about. Okay, so just very, very briefly, um, I talked about working at the intersection of technology training and global health. And so one of the ways of doing that is to take into account um, approaches to learning and, tra and training. So theoretically, um, from an educational point of view, what way can we think about how learning happens? So we can think about it as information dissemination, which is essentially developing things like training manuals, putting um, PDFs on tablets, um, that's shown by educational research to not to be that effective, particularly for practice-based interventions. The other way is to think about learning as sort of problem-based, situated or exploratory, where a teacher or a supervisor is often working as a mentor or facilitator, and um, it's highly contextual and learners are engaged in um, often case-based work. So this is shown to be to be um, pretty effective. Um, another way to think about learning is as a conversation. So almost like a one-to-one -one tutor tutorial. And this is important for um, supervision, which I'll come on to um, now. And so you don't need to understand this diagram, but I just want to highlight the reference is, this is learning theory is thinking about learning as conversation. And this is a conversational framework developed by Diana Lorillard that we use to inform the design of our um, learning technologies. Okay, so that's learning. So what about supervision? Well, um, you probably read a lot about supervision of community health workers, for example, which has been a timely topic of research for a number of years now. And basically what the research says is if a community health worker has ongoing regular support and feedback, i.e. good quality supervision, you can see some more references there on the screen, um, they tend to do a pretty good job, okay? So it's kind of blindingly obvious, I guess, if you, if you think about it. But it's amazing to think about actually um, how then can technology support supervision that is regular um, and allows supervisors to give feedback to community health workers, okay? Um, there's a number of ways in which you can, you can do that. I won't go into that here, but essentially you want to ensure that the supervision is of um, high quality, that it is um, supportive, and that it basically aligns with learning as a, as a conversation, the theory um, I mentioned earlier. Okay, so how, much, how have we done this in the past? Well, um, one project I'll talk about is a community health worker project run with the NGO um, AMREF Health Africa, who some of you may, may know, headquartered in um, Nairobi. And this was a mobile intervention to help community health workers 
assess stages of childhood development um, in under fives. Um, I'll show you a number, link to a number of papers at the end, you can find more details about this. But really, in an image like this, in a situation like this, um, which is where a community health worker is, is visiting a, a mother with a young child, a young baby um, at home, what is the role that mobile technology can play in terms of learning and supervision in this type of context, right? And what we did was we developed a mobile um, application that allows a community health worker to assess the stages of childhood development, to record them and to share them with their supervisor, okay? And so that's um, graphically represented here by the arrow in the middle. So you can imagine the community health worker using the app on the left, the supervisor using the app on the right. And through this interaction, the supervisor is able to provide um, timely and tailored feedback to the community health care worker. Because instead of a community health worker having to reflect on their own um, work and try to talk about that, they can actually share the data that they made to make their decisions. And so the supervisor has not only the data upon which decisions may have been made by the community health worker, um, that they can then use to tailor their supervision, either through the application or face-to-face. -face. Okay, um, in the interest of, of time, I won't go into too much about the methodology of how we developed this, other than to say um, we support taking a highly participatory approach. So we use an approach called participatory action research, in which the design and development and implementation of the mobile training application is done with the community health workers from day one. And there's a couple of slides here on the details and methods you can use um, to do that. And I'm happy to take questions on those at the end if people want more details. But in the interest of time, I won't go into these in any substantive detail here. But also, if you want to follow up with me after this lecture, I'm happy to share this information with you. But I just wanted to highlight the methodical methodological approach taken. Um, so that's the first um, project. And the second one I want to talk about is actually one that's won um, by Chris here that we um, collaborate on, which is looking at um, the role of virtual reality. You can see here um, the HEC headset, Vive headset on the left, and um, a mobile game that the team have developed here um, on the right. And what we're interested in is um, what learning theories best support training in this context. So this is for um, nurses working on, in this case, neonatal um, resuscitation. And I'm going to talk about ongoing work, it's actually quite early work, on using um, artificial intelligence to support the provision of appropriate feedback for the nurse, for the learner. Um, so what happens here, and you can see on the, on the um, left you have the mobile game and on the right you have the virtual reality environment and in both of these situations the game or the life platform is asking the learner um, to make certain decisions so one is what questions you might ask of a departing colleague um, on the left on the right it's to choose from a selection of items before they undertake um, resuscitation and in these spaces, what we'd like to do is to be able to provide appropriate feedback if the nurse needs help in answering these questions. And we want to do that in a naturalistic manner. Excuse me. And um, one way to do this is to analyze what the nurses might say. For example, if they're in a virtual reality space, what questions may they ask? Um, and recognize that they're asking those questions and provide appropriate feedback and we use um, AI algorithms to do that. Okay, let me skip that. Um, and what we're doing is, instead of having to build um, these machine learning algorithms ourselves, we're using open source machine learning libraries, in this case, um, tensorflow.js, which runs in a browser offline, and TensorFlow Lite, which is designed for mobile phones, and both provided by Google. And so, what we, wanted to, what we want to do, just to give you one example, is to answer um, questions that come up in the virtual reality world, okay? So for example, you can see some um, nurses here on the left 
um, and some of our research participants using the virtual reality, the life platform. And in the virtual world, they're um, going through the scenario of resuscitating a newborn baby. Um, and um, the system may want them to answer the following question. What equipment do you want to have ready to resuscitate the baby? OK, so they may say something like, well, what do I need to resuscitate the baby? What equipment do I need to resuscitate the baby? Tell me what I need to get ready. And what we want to be able to do is recognize all those as paraphrases of the same question that want to be answered. OK, I'm not going into the algorithm that does this, but basically in bold there in yellow, you see the highest one is a ranking of how we recognize each of these questions. So, for example, the one in yellow, what equipment do I need to resuscitate the baby is most similar to the question, what equipment do you want to have ready to resuscitate the baby? And if you scroll down, I don't know if I can move my mouse here, you can see the third one from the bottom at 0.34% is not a good match. So tell me what I need to get ready. The system won't be able to recognize that because the match isn't good enough. Um, and this is just one little example of what we're working towards to be able to recognize naturalistic interactions in virtual reality spaces in order to provide answers to um, or feedback to the learner that's appropriate and time sensitive. Um, and that's going pretty well at the, the moment as again, it's ongoing work. Um, so in summary, um, before I, I take questions and then hand over to Judith, um, I'll try to give you an overview of approaches we've been taking to training and learning, highlighting the fact that it's an interdisciplinary approach. I don't think anyone feels can address this on their own. Thinking about the fundamental role that the learning theory needs to play from the beginning of the project. We believe that um, AI and the simple example I'm showing you about paraphrasing would have strong potential um, in global healthcare context, but always keeping in mind um, digital inequalities and drawing on AI for education research where appropriate. Um, and I've got a selection of papers there if you want to follow up on any of these um, areas. I just want to end by thanking everyone, um, including the, the whole team and uh, our Twitter handles, et cetera, are there. So thank you very much. OK, let me just have just a second. Yeah, I think it's working now. So people should still be able to hear me. So that's a really good question, <clears throat> Chris, and it's actually very, very timely. So one of the slides I just um, said over very, very quickly was there's this divide between sort of the AI for good agenda that you've seen with the recent AI for good global summit, for example, in, um, in Geneva, but there's been a big push, push towards the idea that AI um, will support global healthcare in a positive way. But actually on the right of the screen here, there's a number of books, and this is just a selection that shows um, the problems with AI. Right, mainly developed by um, social science and internet researchers, thinking through the ways in which bias, for example, is embedded um, in AI and how it could potentially lead to um, further inequalities. And so one of the ways we've been trying to do that is looking at the data sets we use to, to train our algorithms and making sure they're um, reflective of um, race, gender issues, for example. So um, I think it does have a potential to not do good, let's say, to, to do bad if, if you're not careful. But if you approach, if you approach your design um, and development of your intervention in this informed way, I think you can work towards addressing that problem in a, in a pretty good manner, I would think. But it's ongoing work, as I say. OK, okay thanks very much now. Um, and we've just got a question from Claudia. So I'll just try and uh, unmute Claudia so we can hear her. Hello, Claudia, can you hear us? Hello. Uh, yes, I can hear you. Thank you very much. Uh, my question was uh, picked up actually in your last answer. I don't know if you want to read it out, Chris. Uh, let me just have a look. Um, uh, so it says, thank you, AI has a lot of potential to augment and support healthcare and LMIC, uh, but it can be controversial. How do you propose to reassure users and also how affordable, scalable is this technology? So 
sorry. Thanks, sorry for the question. I just had to unmute, unmute myself there. Um, um, so how um, affordable and scalable it is, but this is why we're trying to work through this AI for all agenda. So one of the things we're interested in is with the availability of open source machine learning libraries that are built into Chrome, for example, and are also built into increasingly built into browsers, that uh, part of the ways in which <clears throat> organizations uh, such as our, our, ourselves can utilize these libraries. Okay, so what we're not talking about is having access, for example, like some hospitals in London who maybe work with DeepMind, for example, to millions and millions of, of images or have access to a big data institute. There's definitely a place for that, but that's, as you say, massively resource intensive. So what we're thinking about is, is ways in which we can still work at the um, cutting edge of innovation, but by leveraging a lot of technical work that's also that's already been been done. So that's how we're trying to address that. Um, and the first question was, oh, how do you re reassure people? I think the only way is to do it is, is the proof is in the pudding. So I think as we work through this, we need to be able to show um, actually it's been um, developed in a fair and equitable way. And that's why um, I, I, I didn't go to the point in the, in the talk, but we tend to take a prioritarian view on the design and development of our, our interventions um, or priority view if you're a philosopher. And so that's the underpinning view rather than a utilitarian one or rather than thinking too much about um, scale from the beginning, because often the needs of the most marginalized can be overlooked if that's the driving intervention. But I'd be happy to talk more about that maybe offline because I'm, I'm aware Judith needs to kick off as well. But I hope that at least partially answers your question, but happy to follow up. Yes, thank okay. you. Great, thanks Niall. And I think there's just another, another couple of questions actually. Um, so one from Abigail that says, um, thank you Dr Niall, concerning the project for community health workers, was there an ICT training uh, of the health workers? And then there's another question um, from Alu, and he said, uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, now, how do we ensure the maximum usage of AI in remote areas of developing countries, considering scalable limitations in my country, uh, Nigeria? Um, so, yeah, so about training uh, local personnel and um, uh, reaching remote areas. Oh yeah, it's working now. Um, thanks, thanks both. So the training, that's a really good point. So we did spend some time um, training community health workers with AMREP, with the local um, NGO, who already have a program in place for facilitating training. So we're building on that. So we're building into existing approaches to training and, and, and programs. Um, we did need to balance that though again. So we gave time for people to sort of get used to and discover the technology for for themselves. So the idea was also to look at ways in which um, people used or appropriated the technology and build on on that. So for example, one of the ways we had a, it's a few years ago now, so we had built our own chat engine into the, into the app and it wasn't really used. And then WhatsApp started to become really popular in Kenya. And so one of the researchers from Kenya suggested we use that and that took off like wildfire. So I think been um, flexible and open to emerging uses on the ground rather than thinking you have to tick all the training boxes up front um, I think is a, is, a, is a good approach so it's this balance between um, developing technical capability if I could call it that around training and use of the tools and been open to thinking about as new um, technologies emerge and new uses of technologies emerge on the ground, how you can leverage those at the, at the same time. Um, the second approach, the second question going back to scale again, I think again, this depends, it's such a, almost a bigger question than projects of the size we'd be involved in. So essentially we're leveraging, for example, um, um, the uptake of, of an, usually Android, um, a little bit with iPhone, but increasingly Android based devices. So the ways in which um, Google and others um, are embedding AI assistive technologies into their into their phones, um, we're building on that. So this research project focused on AI, for example, would not be concerned with the use of feature-based phones. So um, 
in that sense, when we're doing a research project, it's not a development project, we're looking at where we think um, the field may be in three to five years' time. So that's what we're thinking about when we're thinking about scale. We're not thinking about it as an implementation project for today. We're saying, hang on, um, marginalized communities or people in rural communities, what types of technologies might they be able to have access to in three to five years' time? And how can we design interventions now that will be appropriate for them as the, as the technology um, develops? And just a, just a last point on that. So, for example, in Kenya, um, a few years ago when we started, probably late 2000s, um, feature phones were by far the popular, most popular phone. And now it's probably cheap, low-end smartphones. You know, you're $30, $35. And IMF did a, a survey looking at, um, at least in, in, in Kibera, I think, maybe more broadly, I'd have to check with them, um, to say the cost of a smartphone now versus the cost of what people were paying for feature phones 10 years ago is roughly the same. So um, at least when you're developing a research project, I think you don't want to be blinded by the technology people have in their pocket now. Um, development projects, I think, more specifically, do need to focus on that directly. But as we're thinking about where we might be in three to five years' time, that's where, we're, where our focus is. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, okay great. great. So uh, thanks, thanks everybody, everybody for the questions. Uh, so we're just about um, half past. Um, so we'd better just um, uh, pause for a second while we hand over to Judith. And, and we'll start again in just one minute's time uh, once we've got Judith set up. Thank you very much. So. Okay, um, hi everyone, and again, thanks to Chris for organising this event. Um, this is quite exciting, actually. I think this is a great idea <clears throat> um, in terms of bringing everyone together, the three of us in the room here, and sharing some of the ideas and some of the projects we've been working on um, without using carbon. So this is... Um, hopefully going to be a useful afternoon um, for everyone. What I want to talk about um, particularly is um, how we are looking at using mHealth or broadly speaking digital health to support universal health coverage in small island developing states. Um, so um, I work at the University of Auckland in New Zealand and uh, there I may, as Chris mentioned, um, teach on the Global Health Programme. Move our slide. Um, okay, so this um, first slide I like to show um, because it really like uh, I guess it's helpful in positioning where New Zealand is um, in in the global map. We often seem to fall off, slip off the bottom, and the, the Pacific region particularly often um, gets draped around the edges of of a world map. So it's really nice um, I think to demonstrate. Uh, I'll show a map that has the Pacific region, Pacific Islands region really front um, and center, um, but also recognizing that I'm talking about other small island developing states so that include small islands within the Caribbean, the Africa and Asia region as well. I'm particularly going to talk about the Pacific region because that's where I'm uh, based and, and where I do most of my work. Um, so these um, islands, there are 22 Pacific Island countries and territories, and like most small island developing states, um, face considerable uh, challenges, but also opportunities in terms of how they uh, seek to develop, um, uh, of course, grow their economies, but also improve health of their populations. And a recent meeting and focus on small island developing states, or other than, um, otherwise called SIDS, um, priorities, they recognise three main areas um, that are really important. And of course, the fisheries are particularly important to the Pacific and other parts, um, other small island uh, developing states. Fisheries are really important for both uh, health and nutrition, but also for sustainable development security as well. Also really important uh, area is water and sanitation. These are certainly in the, in the context of climate change becoming increasingly um, fragile and um, certainly as interest in, in uh, malnutrition in all its forms or non-communicable disease and sexual reproductive health remain, remain really important concerns for health. 
thinking about some of the really fundamental drivers and risk factors for health are um, in particular for other regions, uh, water and sanitation. And as I mentioned earlier, climate change resilience is really, I would say, one of the, the front um, sort of uh, in foreground issues for um, SIDS. These are absolutely critical um, challenges in terms of how to manage, adapt, and mitigate climate change um, effects on health in particular. So um, a lot of the work around um, developing interventions has been focused on on ch climate change and Fiji in particular has taken a leadership role in this in this field. Um, so in terms of small island developing states and um, what they do collectively, what they can do um, working together to achieve their health outcomes and goals, there's been a really um, in, over the last 10 years and certainly in the last three to four years a focus on partnerships and I'll talk a little bit more about this um, later but they really want uh, partnerships to be the foundation for development and this is all referred to particularly with mHealth or digital health so they want some of the um, partnerships to be really SID specific so really working together across the regions to see where they can share ideas and resources um, capabilities um, and in some respect capacity they want um, these initiatives and partnerships particularly to be uh, measurable uh, and monitorable. So we want to see what the benefits are of working together. They want them to be achievable and accountable in terms of what they're aiming to, to achieve in this collective approach, resource-based and focused. And they want to have very clear timelines for implementation and transparency transparency by all parties. So this idea of actually these small island developing states share common risk factors, common challenges, um, particularly around not just only climate, but other factors. And there's value in, in working together to uh, collectively share resource and achieve um, health specific targets and goals. The recent World Health Assembly, um, there was a strong focus on, um, in particular, two agenda items on small island developing states in relation to the broader theme of the World Health Assembly on uh, universal health coverage, leaving no one behind. And I note particularly uh, um, that there was a lot of discussion around how to improve information systems, how to use digital and other technologies to enable individuals and communities to identify what their health needs are to actively participate in the planning and delivery of these services, and a particular interest in helping and, and working with communities to maintain um, their own health and well-being. So this slide really captures, I think, uh, one of the themes that really transit a lot of the discussion at the World Health Assembly um, a couple of weeks ago. So just focusing particularly on information uh, communication technology status in the Pacific region, um, I'm not speaking to other small island developing states and other parts of the world, but in the Pacific, I think it's interesting and important to think about when we think about digital or mHealth and this understanding that mobile phones are ubiquitous, that everyone has access, um, that um, everyone has a phone in their pocket or access to internet. But in actual fact, in the region, there are huge gaps and the information we gather from the ITU or uh, GSMA, the Global uh, Monitoring um, Services Association, gloss over some of the, of the deeper issues or, or access um, questions in terms of who actually has access to mobile. Um, but the Pacific region has been one of the, I guess, for want of a better word, sort of slower developers or adopters in mobile technologies and ICT, partly because of the remote and uh, remoteness of the region. Some parts of the region are, have only recently been, been connected by satellite, um, submarine cabling and so forth. And there's been a slow switch over to digital. So there is um, absolutely, there is access to ICT. There is definitely a role for using uh, mobile in the region for health um, and, and other um, benefits. We see some really good value um, emerging from that. But I think it's important to recognize in terms of thinking about equity and ensuring access to the benefits of mHealth for all, but particularly the most vulnerable, that keeping an eye on the developments and the gaps in terms of ICT coverage um, it's not quite as, as complete as it, as it appears um, in, in, on, on some websites and some, and some um, provider 
information. And we see here in some of the countries of the Pacific Islands region just mentioned on this slide, so we know that sort of it's Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands and Fiji being the largest Pacific Island countries have the um, highest rates of um, or the highest proportion of the population subscribing to mobile um, and the highest rate of connections. But we go down to some very small island, um, islands such as Nui and Tokelau and Tuvalu which, um, which internet and subscriber penetration is as low as 11-17%. So this is really important when you think about scaling up um, and enabling access to mobile um, technologies for health and who's likely to benefit. So across the region, huge diversity within countries, also considerable diversity that's likely to be patterned not just by geographical location, so remote islands certainly have difficulty in access, but by socioeconomic status and by gender. So uh, internet use, for example, in the Cook Islands, where we're also working, is very expensive. So I want to talk very briefly about one initiative we um, developed um, in partnership with the Ministry of Health in Samoa that, that gives us or gives a, an opportunity to explore some of the challenges and some of the real gains we got from working um, with uh, in a bilateral partnership between New Zealand and Samoa. And in this case, it was it was an initiative designed to adapt a mobile cessation tool. So this is a text message based uh, program to help people who want to quit smoking to give up. And it was designed um, and trialled in New Zealand and in the UK and it found um, good evidence of effects. There was a doubling of quit rates in these two other jurisdictions. So we were curious to see what it would, how it would perform, so to speak, if we adapted it for Samoa. Would it help people quit? Would it reduce um, in terms of their overall health targets? Would it reduce tobacco use? But also we're really interested in the process. What, what happens when you adapt a tool that's been developed for a high income setting where there's an established tobacco control infrastructure and, and program and adapt it for an environment that is very different in terms of both culture, in terms of infrastructure and, and um, priority in terms of tobacco. Um, so I just thought this was useful to demonstrate a little bit. So the program was funded. We wanted an MC station program tailored for an S of Samoa, and we also um, started to work with American Samoa. We wanted to, as part of this process, rather than just take this tool and translate it linguistically, we wanted to establish a governance network, an advisory group, people who would work with us um, to advise us on all stages of that adaptation process. And importantly, one of the outputs, we want to see how much this would cost. We want to be able to be confident when we sat down um, with the Ministry of Health that we had very clear evidence that this would be as effective as, as potentially other interventions to reduce tobacco. So not prioritising M Health because it's new and exciting, but actually because it's evidence based and it actually supports uh, the whole system as well as just supporting people to quit. In terms of outcomes, we wanted to describe this process. So what we went through to adapt this tool, because we thought that would be really useful for other settings, um, other initiatives, um, whether it was other SMS based programs. And we have published our work, which I can share later on that. So that was a very, um, I have to say, quite a time consuming process, very fastidiously undertaken in partnership with um, the Ministry of Health in Samoa, the WHO and civil society um, groups. So uh, we adapt it linguistically, culturally, and, and in terms of uh, references for the local setting. We also wanted to, at the same time, strengthen capacity and local leadership in MC Station because we didn't obviously want to rely on, on our team, obviously working um, with colleagues in Samoa, but it was important to build uh, knowledge around how to adapt and, and run these programs, both within the Ministry of Health, but also in, in the local telcos. So the Blue Sky was their partner organisation. We wanted to work with them so they knew how to and, and knew the strategies and the, and the troubleshooting requirements, um, the technical requirements for running a mobile based programme. And we also, as a broader long-term outcome, uh, we wanted to make progress towards the, the country's uh, health sector plan, which specified a reduction in tobacco use, 
in line with WHO targets around reducing NCDs. And we wanted to enhance, and this was a requirement of the funding, which I can talk about uh, at a, and, and has been discussed in another, in another publication. This, I guess, the sort of challenge is we had a high level agreement to enhance service delivery partnerships between New Zealand, the New United States, which also contributed some funding, and the Pacific. So I guess I'm showing this to say that both on the kind of ground level, there was, an, there was uh, a focus on adapting a tool that we knew worked elsewhere, testing whether it would work in Samoa, but alongside making sure that there was a broader uh, focus on strengthening cap capacity and, and capability to enable this program to be scaled up if it was uh, deemed to be uh, useful at a, at a um, population level, and to ensure that there was ongoing uh, skills within the Ministry of Health to maintain the program. So this is the program, was it successful? Um, so just very briefly, um, there was a 39% report of seven day abstinence at one month follow up. Now that's a very short follow up. We weren't able to follow up over a longer period of time. But these results were consistent with what we found in New Zealand and how in this program uh, also found when it was delivered in the UK. So we're pretty confident and, and other um, evidence suggests that people enjoyed receiving the messages in terms of felt it was providing the valuable support. Um, it was respectful. And it was um, one of the factors they felt may help them quit. So in terms of, of objective outputs, um, we had a program that was tailored. It showed an effect. In terms of systems level value, we remain, uh, I guess, have some questions about how, how useful this was over the longer term. And we really learned a lot in this process. So one of the things we really felt uh, very clear about when we evaluated this process, there's some real practical realities of working in these environments. So these are small islands with low resource. So ensuring that these stakeholders were identified and meaningfully involved. Now that sounds very glib, but that was very difficult. Even though we'd been working uh, in Samoa and had um, good partnerships and, and relationships within the Ministry of Health and across other sectors, identifying the key people to be involved that would ensure that their program had credibility and integrity beyond its trial was really important. We had difficulty in terms of international funding, and you can see in terms of the work plan that we had some very high level requirements of our, our outcomes that were perhaps misaligned with the priorities uh, that Samoa would have set. So I think it was really important to, to align those priorities. And, and of course we had difficulty with the, the funding, the time the funding took to, to be, um, transferred into the Ministry of Health in Samoa uh, was very, um, was lengthy and, and obviously in that case quite costly. Um, difficulties and some challenges around employing local staff. And this isn't from an internal challenges, this is basically the requirements for international funding dictating how these um, staff would be employed and under what conditions, etc. Again, building local technology expertise was, it was um, important absolutely from the beginning because when the program was running and people would stop receiving messages, we needed to have a prompt response uh, and expertise to be able to respond to that. Um, we had to spend time again um, in terms of and working very closely and the New Zealand team didn't play a particularly strong, you know, large role in this. We, our Samoan colleagues um, ran the adaptation pro, uh, process, but really important to get the language, uh, the nuances of the, of the tone, um, the formality of the language and any imagery uh, accepted uh, and, and tested. So this isn't just tested by the end user who may be the smoker, but acceptable at a Ministry of Health level according to their policies. So they would be comfortable in sending that out. And then importantly, but really difficult, um, we realise in terms of measuring and, and monitoring um, the implication, uh, the um, how well this program was integrated into the health system. So ideally, what we wanted to be able to do was have a line in the in the health in the health budget, particularly around maybe NCD prevention, that included cessation if the evidence was strong enough um, and was considered cost effective. Um, that was more pro, uh, time consuming and needed to be started um, right from the concept rather than here's the evidence, we see it can work, now let's talk about integration. 
Again, further lessons. Um, we, as I mentioned earlier, that um, access to, to mobile isn't absolute or seamless, or seamless or necessarily equitable. Uh, phones are shared a lot, and low uh, income or low resource settings, um, and not only because due to low resources, it's just a cultural practice to share phones and share messages. And there's actually some value in that that we could explore in terms of using different types of modalities, perhaps looking at social networking sites to support um, behaviour change rather than the very didactic one person to one uh, message to one phone um, method. We understood the real the importance of really strong governance systems and local commitment right at the very beginning if we think about scaling and sustainability and how that could contribute to broader benefits around universal health coverage. So how did supporting people quit to quit smoking support other objectives that the health uh, sector was working towards and rather than seeing it as, as an adjunct, um, an interesting one at the time, it was relatively novel, but actually if it doesn't add value across the border system, we really need to question its value um, to begin with. I think equity in terms of benefits, um, like Niall talked about, is incredibly important. So you're not exacerbating inequities. And this can only be achieved from my perspective, I guess, through conscious intent. It just doesn't happen on its own. You have to really think about how you make sure those, uh, the, that support is reaching the people who may benefit most. And that comes right from concept and, and engagement with end users, wherever they may be, and design and evaluation. So you really are carefully measuring who's benefit and how who's benefiting and how do we know. I think it's also really important to look at these tools that are already existed, uh, existing around monitoring and evaluation. We know these, the digital health guidelines have been um, released um, and there's monitoring and evaluation guidelines. Uh, so there's a lot of really useful tools um, some more user friendly in terms of adapting in a local context than others, but they're becoming, uh, they're increasingly available and, and I think um, will provide really good support and guidance. We also need to know, uh, realise that evaluating, um, evaluation tools need to be really pragmatic. So RCTs are not necessarily the most useful tool to determine whether this program supported people to quit. We're pretty sure, based on other evidence, uh, that we don't need another RCT. What we needed was to understand that process. At what stage could we have done something differently to ensure that that um, the value of this initiative um, could have been uh, better embedded into, into the health system and supported it. We need to know um, and, and have these evaluation tools reflect context. Um, and these contexts are very specific. Um, and I think it's also important to establish realistic, locally and regionally relevant goals. And this is particularly important for small island developing states who are collectively working towards outcomes. For the Pacific, this certainly um, work towards the regional goal of Tobacco Free Pacific 2025, as well as country level goals of reducing, reducing NCDs. So I show this uh, really as slide as, a, as an indication of the, act, uh, uh, as a representation, I guess, of the activity that's going on and under the banner of the Sustainable Development Goals around securing um, and developing these partnerships of small island developing states, whether it's in relation to fisheries, in terms of um, blue ocean resources, in terms of land use or health. I think there's value um, in exploring what these partnerships actually look like. So in, 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 I guess in summary, for digital interventions, I think these partnerships might at, uh, have a particular um, place rather than um, digital interventions or mHealth interventions being established in an ad hoc way in individual countries across the region, that there is a consideration of sustainable financing across the region for these initiatives that there's a collective interest in building capacity, both human and institutional knowledge around digital interventions. And that there's an environment, an enabling environment to that fosters new partnerships. Um, these partnerships need to be inclusive um, in terms of who can be involved, but also importantly include people that have, import, have expertise that's relevant both now, but also looking into the future about what might be needed to, to deliver, adapt, and, and potentially scale up useful, practical, digital um, 
technologies for health. I think trust is really important, particularly in small island developing states. These are very close communities. There's a lot of collaboration. There is sometimes competition, but though that trust is really important. So information can be readily shared, both when things work and when they don't work um, for mobile health. Again, legal, institutional and governance structures are really important around regulating and developing um, platforms and, other, and governance structures for mobile health. Um, and again, feeding back in results of studies and trials and, and evaluations um, back into these systems. So with our strengthening and growing. Um, and I think we need to invest in, in monitoring, internal monitoring of these partnerships and what impact they have, where they are adding value. Another area that's it's a challenge across the Pacific region is, is around some practical measures, uh, measures that are consistent, um, practical across the region for um, monitoring and evaluation frameworks to assess progress, not just in partnerships for digital health, but actually on the programs and the, and the um, interventions themselves. And we also need to access, increase access to data for knowledge transfer. And again, that goes back to feeding back into the system um, evidence from trials um, that have been undertaken, evidence from other forms of, of evaluation that help build a, a broader, more comprehensive understanding about the value of, of mobile um, technologies for achieving universal health coverage in the region. And with that, I'd like to thank you all and acknowledge um, my uh, colleagues and, and our partners in the Pacific region. Thanks. Great, thank you so much, uh, Judy. That was a, a fantastic presentation. Um, so we've, we've got our first question come in. I might see if I could display it on your screen. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, so. Okay. So thanks, Claudia. Um, so your question is, you're interested in the point about social factors and social media. People often believe that their friends say more than what their doctors, teachers and the government say. So you're asking whether I have any thoughts on how public health can best utilise digital social networks and influence in a way that is Claudia. <laughs> facilitating and not manipulating. Um, and I can't quite read the rest of that. Uh, so, um, so just to answer the first part of your question, I think it's really, um, I think, I mean, it's an issue that we've we've been discussing a lot in in, in uh, the work that we're developing in the future. So, I think social networks are really important, and we just had some informal discussion in this room about um, for about the use of WhatsApp and and particularly in the Pacific, Facebook for. Um, not just sharing information and collect, connecting families in the, in the Pacific diaspora population across the Pacific Islands region in Australia and New Zealand, but for potentially um, supporting uh, whether it's behaviour change or I prefer to use or look at social change. Um, so I think there's really important opportunity in that, in the sense that um, these uh, mechanisms are organically developed, we're not imposing or kind of um, using sometimes not always the most trusted or credible um, uh, sources of information uh, in some ways. And so I think there's a scope to, to develop some work and seeing how we can work with those platforms. There are some risks, and certainly in the context right now around um, concerns about privacy and, and use of data. These studies we've just, um, we're finding out are very difficult to undertake and get funded. Um, so, I guess to answer the question, I think it's it would be it's a potential scope. I think it's really good to use what people prefer to use. Sending text messages to people about behaviour, individual behaviour change in the Pacific is not. Uh, it's culturally slightly misaligned. Um, people engage collectively. They think about their health in a collective, more collectivist uh, way rather than personal individual behaviour change. And I think these platforms and these mechanisms are better suited to that. 
I think it would be really good to learn out uh, for certainly for um, I'm interested in learning about social network analysis to, able to better understand how these uh, messages have been uh, transmitted and moving through communities, how resilient they are and whether they do shift uh, perceptions collectively and, and behaviors. So um, but I think you're, I think if I'm getting your question correctly, I think it's it's a really sensitive area. I think it's really important to be really cautious around how we develop that, not to um, uh, to break trust um, in these really valued networks. Facebook is absolutely critical to Pacific Islanders who connect um, back to their home countries. Okay, I think we've just got time for one more question. And uh, there's one popped up on the chat. Okay, so um, the question from um, is what in your experience are the best practices we can learn from that can help shift interventions from piloting phase to being institutionalized, appropriated and sustained by local governments? Um, this is a great question. Um, so I certainly know what we wouldn't do. Um, and that uh, number one would be, I think one or if I flip that the other way, one of the best practices is um, is when an initiative has come from the country itself. We're working with the Cook Islands at the moment who've approached us, the Ministry of Health has approached um, our team um, based on the work we've been um, doing with the Ministry of Health in Samoa, uh, wanting to collaborate with us to develop a mobile and in cessation program for the Cook Islands. So we've only very early, um, early stage on this initiative, but my sense is the beginning is good. So this isn't us coming to a country going, we've got a great idea for you guys, and it's going to look a bit like this, what do you reckon? And something, an initiative that comes with funding and is and at this stage with Samoa was kind of new um, and looked like it would have an effect and everyone supposedly has a phone. I like this the beginnings of this project. So the, the initiative has come from within the country or the, the key uh, institution who will be um, rolling it out, uh, implementing it longer term. That's really important. And I think, again, as we progress throughout the year, we um, we will probably spend less of our resource. Um, we've got a, a relatively small budget, which is absolutely fine. Less uh, resource precisely adapting every word and every nuance but more resource, making sure that it is going to have the mechanism for distribution once it's it's tested. So thinking about that right from the beginning. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Jude and Niall, and thank you everyone for your questions and your participation. Um, so we're going to finish up now as we uh, just had an hour's uh, long uh, e-seminar. And uh, we'll be sending out an email to everybody who attended, which will contain a certificate of attendance and um, a link to a survey as well. So if you could give us some feedback on how you found uh, the seminar, then we can make some changes um, uh, for the next one to meet everyone's needs. Uh, but thanks everyone for attending. And we'll be sending out, if you um, are a member of the Health Informatics Forum, we'll be sending out a notification of the next uh, e-seminar in the next couple of days. Uh, so look out for that and you can register for the next seminar. Okay, thanks everyone.